Hey guys, how's it going? I hope everybody's doing well out there today. In this video, we're going to take a look at a self-hosted open source collaborative bookmark manager called Linkwarden that allows you to collect, organize, and archive web pages. So the objective of Linkwarden is to organize useful web pages and articles that you find across the web into one place. And since useful web pages can go away, Linkwarden also saves a copy of each web page as a PNG screenshot, as well as a PDF, ensuring accessibility even if the original content is no longer available. Additionally, Linkwarden is designed with collaboration in mind, and this means that sharing links with the public and or allowing multiple users to work together seamlessly is super easy. You can even group bookmarks into collections and share those collections with friends and colleagues, or again, to the public. Hey, wh while I've got you here, do me a favor and don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoy this video. Also, be sure to let me know what your thoughts are on this video in the comment section down below. Installing Linkwarden is pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. The first thing that we're gonna wanna do is SSH into our Docker server and clone the Linkwarden GitHub repository by typing git clone and then the uh, GitHub repository. And then we're going to hit a space and then type in Linkwarden. And that will allow us to clone that repository into a folder called Linkwarden. Once that's done, we'll want to CD into the Linkwarden directory that we just cloned into. And now we're gonna run a command that is ls-a, and that's going to show us all of the files and folders, including files and folders that start with a dot. Those are usually hidden, and adding the dash a will make sure that we can see those. Now, what we're gonna see is all of the files and folders that we've just downloaded. And the first thing we wanna do is rename the .env.sample file to just be .env. And we can do that by typing mv, space dot env dot sample space dot env. That's just moving the file from one file name to another. Now we'll want to edit the env file with vi or nano or whatever your editor of choice is. Now the only thing that you must change here is the Postgres password and the very sensitive secret. Both of those should be different secret phrases. Now there are other settings in here that you can change if you want to, but most of them won't have any impact on our installation. The pagination underscore take underscore count is for pagination on your dashboard, so you can adjust that however you want. You can enable or disable registration via this file as well. There's a section for AWS S3, uh, but those are up to you if you want to use those. And you'll also see the SMTP settings in this file, but those aren't going to work unless you recompile the image yourself. This particular image was compiled without the SMTP settings enabled, and there will be a link in the description with more information about how to compile this yourself to get those SMTP settings. As noted in this file, the Stripe settings don't apply to us, so we can skip those. Again, be sure to change the Postgres password line to have your desired database password in it. Now you can save and exit the file. Next, we're gonna take a look at the docker-compose.yml file uh, just by doing vi or nano and then the docker-compose.yml. Uh, and so this is a very standard configuration with just a couple of services in it. The first service is the Postgres database. Uh, it tells us what Docker image to use, and in this case, it's going to be the official Postgres database. And it's got a reference to the .env file that we just looked at, as well as a restart policy of always. Now below that is where the data will be stored, basically where on your system will the database reside. And you will probably want to change that to wherever you store your data. The other service in this Docker Compose is the Link Warden app itself. Now it also references the .env file that we modified earlier, and the environment variable that we see here is for the connection to the database. There is no need to modify this line at all, so just leave it as it is. Next, we've got a restart policy of always, just like we saw earlier. And then we've got our link warden image listed. Now there's nothing here that you need to change unless there's a specific version of link warden that you need. Otherwise, just leave this alone. Now the app will be available on port 3000 by default, but if you've already got an app using port 3000, then you can change the first 3000 that's here to something else, but don't change the 3000 after the colon. That's what the container is looking for. Again, we've got a volume where your files will be stored, so map this to wherever you need to map your storage. The last line just tells the system that the database needs to be up and running before the Link Warden app tries to start up. And that's it. Once you've got things set up the way you need them, you can save and exit the file. Now we'll just need to deploy the containers with a simple command of docker compose up dash D. 
If you get an error saying that that doesn't work, you can also try running docker dash compose up dash D. Um, this just has to do with which version of docker compose you have on your system. If one doesn't work, the other will. Also, the dash D is just to make sure that the containers um, being up and available isn't dependent on our terminal window remaining open. After a couple of uh, moments, the containers will be up and running. So we can head over to our browser and put in our server's IP address into the uh, URL bar, as well as the port on the end of that IP address. Now, once the page loads, you'll just want to create an account and then log in with your new account. Of course, the first time you log in, there won't be much going on. So let's fix that by adding a link. Click the new link button near the top and now enter the URL that you want to save. Currently, there are no collections just yet, so we can skip that. But if you click more options, you'll see that you can add a name, tags, and a description. And something that I noticed is that you can add tags on the fly here, but for some reason, you can't add collections the same way. I'm not sure if this is an oversight or a limitation of the software, but I would love to have the ability to add collections as easily as I'm able to add tags. Next, you can put in a custom description if you want. And once you're happy with everything here, you can click add. The system will add your URL and then the page will reload. Now you can head over to the unorganized folder unless you've actually added a, uh, a category here and then you can head to that folder um, over on the left side of the page and then you should see your link in the main body of the page. Across the top of the page we'll see either unorganized or whatever uh, category that you put in there. Across the top of the page we'll see in our case unorganized or whatever category title you have with a double arrow that we can use to sort our links and next to that is an icon of three dots. When you click those three dots you'll see the option to edit the collection info, share or collaborate, or delete the collection. If you click the edit option you can change the name, the icon color, and the collection description. If you click the share and collaborate option, you'll see an option to make the collection public. And if you click that and then click save, you'll get a URL that you can share with anyone and they'll be able to see your links. Now, at this time, the public share pages aren't great. They're very bland and only share the link. So they don't share the screenshot or the PDF at this time, but I've talked to the developer and those things will be addressed in upcoming releases. So now let's go back to the collection page with our link on it. So now let's click that three dot icon near the top again and click share slash collaborate. Below the public URL that we just enabled, we'll see a spot for member management. In the text box below that, we can share the collection with other members of the site and even change their ability to create, update, or delete items in the collection. Be sure to only give the permissions necessary for whoever will be accessing these collections. So now let's go back to the collection page with our link on it again. We'll see the link and some other information as well as that same three dot icon that we saw earlier. Go ahead and click the icon, and from here we can pin the link to our dashboard for quicker and easier access. We can also edit or delete the link from there. And if you click the link that we just created, you'll see link details and edit link across the top. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Next, you'll see the link, the description of the link, and a couple of archived formats, as well as the date the link was saved. Now, depending on the link that you're saving and your system and, and all kinds of different factors, the page might take a moment to generate the screenshot and the PDF. So just give it a minute if it's not ready yet. To view either of those files, you can click the box arrow icon thing that's over there. And one thing that I can say is I've noticed that the PNG screenshots are usually more accurate than the PDF shares are at this point, but that can always be updated in an upcoming release. So that is the core functionality of Link Warden at the time of making this video anyway. But there is one thing that we didn't look at just yet, and that's how to update your account. So going back to the dashboard, there's an account icon in the top right hand corner of the page. And if you click that, you can edit your account settings, switch to light mode or log out. So let's do the only thing that makes sense here and click settings. On the first page, you can update your profile image, display name, and username. And on the privacy settings link, you can make your account private or import your browser bookmarks via an HTML file, which I think is kind of cool. And of course, on the password page, you can update your password. Very, very simple to use here. So that's how to install and use Link Warden. Now I've chatted with the developer via email and they seemed very open to my thoughts and ideas. So if you have some thoughts or ideas of your own, be sure to head over to their GitHub page and let them know what you're thinking. As always, everything will be linked in the video description. And again, don't forget to like and subscribe and maybe leave a comment down below to let me know what you think of Link Warden. Or maybe you've got a video idea uh, that you could leave down there as well. In any case, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. I do wanna thank you guys for spending a few minutes of your day with me today, and I'll talk to you in the next video.